President Trump makes yet another statement on the violence this weekend in Charlottesville, and this time he finally called out the white supremacists and hate groups by name. But is it way too little, way too late? Also, heavily armed militia members were in Charlottesville, and they were allowed to openly carry handguns and long guns as well. We have Virginia's loose gun laws to thank for that. That was a factor many people aren't talking about from the incident this weekend. And then later, Barack Obama looking to make a comeback. He's not running for anything, but he wants to help Democrats make a run at taking over Congress and the White House. Is he the right messenger at the right time for the party? Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman, in tonight for Richard French. We're going to spend a good chunk of this program focusing on the violence we saw this weekend in Charlottesville, Virginia, and of course the fallout that's reverberated around the country since then. We're going to look at President Trump's response and how it evolved, to put it kindly. We're also going to take a look at the heavily armed militias that marched through the streets of Charlottesville and how Virginia's loose gun laws might have helped make what was a bad situation there even worse. But we're going to start with the latest on the man charged with ramming his car into the crowd, killing a woman and injuring more than a dozen others. 20-year-old James Alex Fields Jr. appearing before a judge via video is ordered to remain in jail and his bond denied. <laughs> charged with the murder of Heather Heyer and a hit and run that injured more than a dozen others in Charlottesville could now face additional federal charges. Racism is evil. President Donald and Trump responding to critics who blasted him for not initially denouncing the white nationalist groups directly and forcefully today announced a civil rights investigation is underway. ABC News learning the FBI is now reviewing the suspect's background to determine if the attack was a hate crime or domestic terrorism. His mother is in disbelief after learning of his involvement over the weekend. I didn't know it was white supremacists. I thought it had something to do with Trump. But others who knew Fields in the past say they are not surprised. He was vocal about his ideas. He proclaimed himself as a Nazi and as a white supremacist. It wasn't a secret. Meanwhile, in Charlottesville. We're also starting to, to get back on our feet and look toward the future. A promise from the mayor to move forward more united, while the mother of the 32-year-old paralegal killed in the crash Five vows to make I sure her knew. daughter did not die She's in vain. Free. I lost my child, and I'm heartbroken over that. And I would grieve in private, but she stood for something. And by golly, I'm going to advocate that let's make that a strong movement as my child was a strong child. There is obviously a lot to talk about and a lot to unpack. Helping me to do that tonight, Jeannie Zeno, professor of political science at Iona College. She's also a senior advisor at the consulting firm Applied Techonomics. Next to her, Dominic Carter, political journalist and author. And on the other side of the table, retired NYPD Lieutenant Darren Porcher. Welcome all. Thanks for having us. Before we get into a lot of the detail, a lot of the specifics, and we drill down on this. I, I All day long as I've been working on preparing the show, I keep coming back to the overwhelming sadness that I feel just from seeing everything that played out this weekend. And I just wanted to go around the room and get everybody's reaction to what they saw. I, I think it's important to do that before we start drilling into the hows and whys. And Darren, I'll start with you. What was your reaction when you saw everything play out in, in Charlottesville? Well, this acrimonious uh, and contentious relationship that existed in Charlottesville is not reflective of the United States. This was something that was focused on a, a number of white supremacist groups that felt that they had a platform that they can express the discontent with the removal of a statue of General Robert E. Lee. You had people that were on the other side that opposed them, and unfortunately, I don't feel that the necessary security fortifications were put in play, and it subsequently resulted in both entities coming together resulted in the death of this woman. And we'll talk more about security a little bit later on in the show. Jeannie, what was your reaction when you saw it? It's hard to believe in 2017 that this is where we are. And I think that was my reaction. And of course, uh, you know, I also look at some of the rhetoric that we've heard on, on the, the most recent campaign, 2016, and how that seems to have precipitated a lot of a, a lot of this anger and resentment and violence, or at least made it, you know, possible for people to, to go out and, and to join together and do these kinds of horrific things. So to me, it's, it was just a very sad moment. Tom? Same. Uh, hard to believe that the country that elected Barack Obama president of the United States, that this is happening right outside, basically, of, uh, of Washington. But my, my, my initial reaction was that bad things happen all the time. 
That may not be the politically correct answer, but bad things happen all the time. It's the response. So, of course, we're going to talk about this. <clears throat> the president dropped the ball, and I strongly feel that we have to return to the days. I know the right took exception to this, but we have to return to the days of law enforcement infiltrating organizations. The, the, the FBI did a great job in taking down the Ku Klux Klan in years mm. past because they had agents that were so good that infiltrated the organization. Uh, my question is, how could law enforcement, federal agents, not have infiltrated to know that one or two groups, or one group in this case, may have been looking to, to spark violence? Yeah, I mean, they were posting everything on social media. This was not a secret. I mean, we knew on Friday that there was an event planned for Charlottesville. Nobody knew it was going to descend into what we saw over the weekend. It also strikes me that we've seen racially tinged violent incidents several times in recent years, particularly in the heat of the summer. We, You know, the Castile and the Sterling cases and the reaction to them last year, Baltimore, Ferguson. We, this one is different because this was... This was angry white people who feel like they're losing the country somehow, as opposed to, you know, what we saw in a lot of those other incidents, were, which were reactions to violent police encounters. And, I, and I'm just wondering, Darren, if you saw any difference in that, just in, in that it's not, these people feel like they're somehow I, I don't, losing the country. And we kept hearing that, ra that rallying cry from them in Charlottesville. Well, one thing that we need to point out was this was the largest white supremacy uh, demonstration in 10 years. So there's been a lot of built up animosity that has been targeted towards this particular event because you had white supremacists that came from all over the country to admit, that were in attendance for this, coupled with the, um, the destruction or the removal of General Robert E. Lee's statue. So you had that coupled with the political climate, whereas you have people that are on the <clears throat> alt-right that felt that this was a platform that introduced this, this state of acrimony. So the difference between this as opposed to what happened with, let's say, Philando Castile, mm -hmm. um, the Alton Sterling shooting, this is something that people were invited into as opposed to a result of a police action that happened in the past. Sean Hannity was comparing the violence in Charlottesville to Black Lives Matter, looking for a certain amount of equivalency there. Do you see any connection? Do you see any mirror imaging between what happened this weekend and what they claim would be violence stemming from Black Lives Matter? You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I looked at, I, in no way, shape, or form am I a proponent of the organization Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter. But Black Lives Matter, I have yet to see uh, a demonstration where there were members of Black Lives Matter that caused the death of someone else. So i give you an example. We look at the demonstration that happened as, um, down in Dallas where we had uh, several police officers that were killed. That individual, the homicidal maniac that shot and killed these officers was not a member of Black Lives, La excuse me, Black Lives Matter. I kind of equate Black Lives Matter to Occupy Wall Street and those okay. types of organizations. And I see it's more of hyperbole than anything else. So when you ask me um, about Sean Hannity equating the two together, I feel it's very difficult for you to assimilate them as one and the same. I, I, I agree. I just wanted to, I wanted to ask. Dominic, it does seem like the counter-protesters who came to Charlottesville were looking to get into it. They weren't there just to shake their heads or yell. I mean, it seemed like there was a preparation for violence there, too. Is there some blame that falls on the counter-protesters, the ones who were there to oppose the white supremacists? Good question. Um, I don't know. I, my hunch is that I would answer no. That's what I really want to answer. <clears throat> but, Andrew, I return to my original premise. I, I remember many years ago, uh, the NYPD, and it was a big uproar, but some will say they understand why they had to do it. They had what they call the Black Desk, a division in the NYPD whose sole job was to infiltrate, and this goes back to the days of Malcolm X in New York City. Because when Malcolm X was assassinated, it was a, a New York City undercover police officer that was right there that didn't want to blow his cover. So when we're looking, if you're going to look at blame, I'm not blaming law enforcement because they lost two of their own in that mm -hmm. helicopter crash. But the country, I'm not big on all of this civil liberty stuff. I know you are. But we've got to know, meaning the country, what's going on with these nuts. And these are nuts that are happy because they want to see us divided 
all the time. This is not new. You said white people angry. This is not new. This is nothing new at all. But it's been infiltrated in the past. But those on the right objected to it being infiltrated by federal agents. Thus, it stopped. And then something like this can happen. And to your point, the country has a history, a cyclical history when it comes to the rise of white nationalist movements. It has happened repeatedly throughout our history, going back to the period after the Civil War. It tends to pop up in response to progressive movements that we've seen over the course of history. And it, it ends up being defeated almost universally if we're looking for a silver lining coming out of everything that we saw this weekend. We are scheduled to have an interview with an author who has written extensively about white nationalist movements in the United States, the history of it, and the fact that they do not succeed and they tend to pop up in cyclical fashions and are defeated generally uh, by people banding together. But that is for tomorrow. We're going to take our first break. When we come back, the politics of what we saw this weekend. First, the president blamed everyone for Saturday's violence. The right-wing hate groups were to blame, and so were the people who were protesting those groups. It took the president two days to specifically denounce the KKK and neo-Nazis, and that is part of a pattern.